All right. Hey, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, hope you have been enjoying yourself so far. All right. Uh, so uh, today uh, we'll be now we'll be having our TIE forum, our second TIE forum, and uh, without further ado, all right, uh, I'll pass the mic to uh, Mister Mister Kevin Cobley, right, and he'll be uh, starting today's uh, forum, right. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to the IGARS Geospatial Business Startup Workshop, Asia Pacific Region. And again, thank you all for coming and a very warm welcome to our distinguished panel of speakers, business executives today. My name is Kevin Corbley and I'll serve as your moderator for today's session. I'm the president of Corbley Communications based in Colorado. And for the past 30 years, my firm has provided marketing communications and business development services to geospatial companies worldwide. And as part of that work, I have been involved on the startup teams uh, during various phases of early development for some of the uh, biggest companies in the industry, Space Imaging, Digital Globe, RapidEye, uh, GOI, RadarSat, just to name a few. And today we'll be hearing about the startup journeys of four geospatial companies here in the Asia Pacific region. But first, a bit of background on the IGARS business startup series. Uh, several years ago, IGARS made an effort to introduce more business content into the conference. And that is uh, one of the reasons that the Technology Innovation and Education Group uh, started and is now uh, quite active today, doing a number of things in addition to the startup uh, series. So uh, for the past several years, we've organized um, sessions that focus on entrepreneurship uh, pr primarily because young people who are coming out of university uh, in many parts of the world never had entrepreneurship as part of their formal education, and we're hoping to, uh, to change that today. So I want to give a big thanks to the GRSS committee that organizes IGARS for uh, committing to these business startup uh, workshops. So uh, let's get started. So the format today is we'll have uh, each of the speakers come up give a, a brief presentation about their company and their startup journey to date. And uh, each of them will speak about 10 minutes or so. And then we'll wait for all of them to speak. And at the end, we'll take uh, questions and answers from the audience. So without further ado, our first speaker is Dr. Motoyuki Arai. He's the founder and CEO of Synspective in Japan. And he began his career working at a US-based consulting firm in Tokyo for five years to support more than 15 global companies to design new business and technology strategies to formulate corporate governance and to build the internal controls necessary to run global companies. He received his PhD in technology management for innovation from the University of Tokyo. During his time there, he focused his research on construction of energy systems to promote economic growth in developing countries. He then implemented his, technology, his knowledge of business development to solve social issues in areas such as energy, water, and sanitation, agriculture, and recycling in Saudi Arabia, Bangladesh, Laos, Cambodia, Kenya, Tanzania, and devastated areas of Japan. So Dr. Moto, let me invite you up uh, to, to speak. Yep. Thank you for introduction. I'm Moto Yukiarai, uh, CEO of Synspective. Uh, good evening, everybody. So uh, uh, Synspective is, yeah, here is our uh, business model. 
So it's a Japan-based uh, startup company. So uh, we are solution provider with our own SAR satellite constellation. SAR stands for, as you know, a synthetic aperture radar. So we're gonna launch multiple SAR satellite and uh, we will provide, uh, we are providing uh, two type of services. So first one is, uh, as you see, uh, SAR data cell uh, to basically defense and the intelligence sector uh, for the many uh, governments. And the second service is uh, yeah, solutions uh, through analysis with data science and the machine learning technology uh, to convert the SAR data to the information, uh, usable information for uh, daily operation by uh, infrastructure uh, players and the energy resource developers and the insurance companies like that. So that's our business model. And uh, we already provide uh, this uh, type of data uh, to the uh, DNI, defense intelligence sector. So here is, uh, I'm gonna say, imagery data of Tokyo. So you can see uh, right hand, bottom right hand, uh, you can see the Imperial Palace in Tokyo and left hand, Haneda Airport. So it means one shot covers over 1,000 kilometer square with one meter resolution. So it's completely new data set, uh, expand uh, data, and uh, you can get the frequency, uh, how can I say, in near future. So that's our value of the data. And, uh, but it, yeah, looks like X-ray picture. So uh, to understand that uh, picture, we need medical doctor, right? So we provide the solutions uh, for industrial users. So uh, yeah, from, le uh, from left side, uh, land displacement monitoring for uh, construction companies like that, and the flood damage assessment for governments and the insurance companies. And the, yeah, it's a little bit difficult uh, to see uh, the forest monitoring. So it's identified the biomass volume to uh, simulate the CO2 provided by this uh, forest. So that these are uh, solutions that can be provided uh, with our SAR satellite constellation. And <laughs> In result, uh, so actually we are world's only uh, company to have the capability both of uh, data provision, expand uh, satellite data provision and the solution provision. So it's our strength and very unique point. And as a result, uh, we already uh, got about $200 million. Uh, so it's a little bit changed uh, because of the recent Big Japanese, yeah. but uh, yeah, over two hundred million dollars uh, for uh, forty uh, four point five years so far, and also one hundred sixty three members from twenty five countries. So this achievement is already recognized by the yeah, global market like this. Uh, yeah, so that's our achievement so far. But in addition, I think uh, we uh, enjoyed the uh, Japanese startup environment as well. Uh, so, for example, you can see the uh, next minister prize at the yeah, Nippon Startup Award. So we got it. So it's promote uh, yeah, startup uh, activities. And also it's, how can I say, is the uh, startup company to join the national program process. So how can I say this? Uh, the support by the government is very uh, yeah, helpful for us. And as well, uh, support in uh, tax of stock options and the anchor tenant scheme and open innovation by the uh, yeah, industrial sectors. So it's also a push up our achievement. So yeah, we enjoy this yeah, environment so far. And uh, I think it's gonna be continued. Yeah, so that's the inspected story. And this is my story. So as uh, yeah, Kevin mentioned, I have so very experience before uh, since back to the establishment. So uh, when I was a university student, I wanted to be a rocket scientist, but I gave up to be a rocket scientist because of the, uh, how can I say, the lack of the scalability. So it's, I think it's almost yeah, 20 years ago and uh, almost, how can I say, industrial activity depends on the national budgets, even in NASA like that. So uh, how can I say, we need commercialize and uh, industrialize the space development. But anyway, I take so long time. So I gave up uh, to be a rocket scientist, but I joined uh, the consulting professional firm, consulting firm. 
and I spent uh, five years and uh, yeah, I wanted to get the higher, higher level concept to contribute uh, the social, to solve the social issues with cutting edge technologies. And then I re-entered the university and I select social business uh, in developing countries and the new, how can I say, leapfrogging system in developing countries. I select that uh, as my uh, PhD thesis theme. And then uh, after that, I was dispatched to Saudi, Saudi Arabian government uh, for the new urban design project, international urban design project. So the NASA and the renewable, renewable US Renewable Energy Labo uh, also joined this project. And uh, yeah, so actually at this uh, project, I used the uh, satellite data, <laughs> uh, meteorological data to identify the best uh, solar power plant location like that. And then uh, after close the project, I joined a startup company to promote the rural electrification in Tanzania. <laughs> so I uh, lived in Dar es Salaam uh, for uh, several years and I yeah, uh, did the marketing uh, activity in the rural area. Yeah, with the, yeah, seeing the very beautiful nature. Uh, yeah, it's very yeah, good experience for me. And then after that, I uh, yeah, came back to Japan and in that moment, uh, we have to recover from the uh, East Japan earthquake. So it huge damage and uh, yes, yeah, so anyway, we have to recover uh, the infrastructure and the industrial, I mean, supply chain and everything. And I joined uh, some of the project uh, in the yeah, renewable energy installation viewpoint. And also I joined several, yeah, uh, social business development project uh, for the uh, Japanese companies. Oops. Yeah, and then uh, through this uh, project's experiments, I was aware that uh, one of the very important fact uh, to achieve the sustainable development, data-driven management is very important because I joined so many projects and I got so many experiments, new thing. I learned so many things, but it's, accumulated inside of me, it's not scalable actually. It's the same problem in space development, right? So I have to develop, uh, so I have to establish a company with my colleagues and uh, how can I say, to yeah, extend my experience and the professional ex uh, experience uh, in global market. So yeah, data-driven management is the key uh, for the yeah, sustainable development and then to make the whole earth data. Satellite constellation is very good technology for that. And also AWS or GCP can promote the understanding of the huge data to leverage our brain, expert brain. So uh, this combination of the technology and business development uh, is the beginning point of this spectrum. And then, uh, yeah, as I explained, uh, we, so the now, uh, yeah, established since back then, 2018. And uh, actually our core technology of SAS satellite comes from the national R&D program uh, led by the cabinet office of prime minister. So actually prime minister. And uh, uh, yeah, many talented engineers and uh, yeah, core technologies uh, comes from provided by this uh, impact program, national R&D program. So what we have to do, what I have to do is business development with this uh, technology and engineers. So uh, I have gonna say, uh, invite some of my uh, colleagues and professionals to a uh, perspective and there's a beginning of a perspective. And uh, additional, uh, say, in addition, uh, one of the very important point is we don't, we didn't wait for the launching of a satellite we provide a solution in advance of the launching to know about the market needs. It's very important approach uh, for the lean startup. So uh, yeah, that's our way to develop. And uh, here is very important three key success factors for startups. I learned about this uh, in, yeah, before the Synspective establishment because I got something failure 
in uh, other uh, startup. So first one is team member is very important. Team is everything for your business, actually. So we never uh, compromise about the, how can I say, team development. And the second one is practical core technology is very important. Practical one is very important. Yeah, of course, uh, R&D type business model, uh, maybe it's a different from our business model, but uh, yeah, practical technology can be used by the customers as an initial step. And then we can brush up, we can improve our service. So this practical technology is very important. And the last one is trend in market and policy. So the governmental policy and the yeah, market trend. So for our case, data, big data market and the space industry. Sounds very fancy, right? <laughs> and it sounds very, yeah, uh, how can I say, growing up towards sky. So this trend and acceptance of the market is very important. So these three points is, I think is very uh, important key points for startup. And then uh, currently we have two satellites, but the next year we're gonna have additional four satellites and we will have the six satellites to provide the daily data anywhere in the world and any weather conditions. And by uh, 2026, are we going to have 30 satellites to provide every two hour data? And uh, it can, how can I say, change uh, the, how can I say, earth observation and remote sensing through sky. So that's, uh, yeah, our story and uh, my story as well. Thank you so much. All right, terrific. Thank you. Dr. Moto, and I hope you all were taking notes when he made the comment about the importance of the team. Um, some of you may remember that uh, IGARS, the virtual IGARS in 2020, we did a uh, startup uh, workshop. It was virtual and we talked about getting funding for a new business. And two of the speakers made the point that um, didn't matter how good your idea is, if you do not have the right team, you're not gonna get funding. So that was uh, really a key takeaway point. Thank you, among many great takeaway points. So um, great. So we're going to uh, move on. All right. We're gonna line up the next uh, presentation, but I'm gonna introduce the next speaker. Uh, Zinji Chong. He goes by JX. He's the founder and CEO of Aonic, formerly Polydrone, a leading UAS or drone solutions company based in Cyberjaya, Malaysia, as well as Bangkok, Thailand. In 2019, he was recognized as a Forbes Asia 30 Under 30 recipient for Polydrone's work in the agriculture sector. JX is a certified remote pilot under the Civil Aviation Safety Authority Australia, and he holds a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering degree from Monash University in Australia. He firmly believes that automation is key to sustainability in the agriculture sector. Let's welcome JX. Hello, that's... Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for the introduction. And it's been really impressive listening to Dr. Muto and the team, the panelists here, talking about their journeys before the session. And one thing I realized very quickly was, we are a drone company, we are on the ground. These guys are all up in space. They're all talking about satellites and going out to other planets and so on. And that's really, really impressive. But today, I'm not gonna have any slides today because I believe the thing that I want to share it's really about our journey and a bit less on the solutions that we are building as a company. But first off, Polar Drone as a company, as the name suggests, or Aonic right now, we started off as a drone company back in 2016. So that was when um, I just graduated from uni. Similar to Dr. Muto, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, did my aerospace engineering degree and astrophysics degree. But then actually on the first day and the last day of uni, our lecturers were telling us that hey, why did you even pick this degree and finished it? There is no jobs in this industry, at least not in Australia. And that was the reality of the industry where there's so few jobs that you had to create your own opportunity if you wanted to be in the space. So in 2016, I came back from Australia to Malaysia 
and I was working at Intel up in Penang, a small island up north of Malaysia. And back there, I was actually working not in engineering, not in product, but in the finance division. And the reason why I worked in that finance division from an engineering degree was I wanted to understand how the world works, how business works. And in fact, that's one of the key critical elements of starting a business. So I would spend a year there. And in 2016, that's where Poladra, now Aeonic, started. When I started the company, it had nothing to do with what we are doing today, nothing related to geospatial. It was a very simple idea. I like playing with drones. We just wanted to use it to offer photography, videography services to clients across the region. That's it. It's very simple. And hence where the name, our previous name, Pula Drone, came out. It's a combination of Polaroid and drones, making it easy for customers to get photos, to get videos, and so on. But what we quickly realized was, as we went out and offered more services, industrial customers started coming to us and asking us to do mapping of their farms, of their roads, infrastructure projects, and so on. And it wasn't just videos and photos anymore from there. Projects got bigger and bigger, and we had to sort of break into that whole geospatial space. And we didn't know, to be frank, our, uh, me, the team, we had zero experience in geospatial. Uh, we were a bunch of engineers, who like playing with drones, like taking photos and videos and stumbled into the industry. So that whole journey was extremely tough for us where we suddenly had to understand what was all your, do you guys maybe very simple, like RTK, PPK, geopositioning data, um, your cost reference and so on. It was something completely new for us and we had to pick that all up. So that was what happened for our company in 2016, 2017, where we transitioned from a pure drone company into a mapping company for drones. And that was at the same time, it was very lucky for us where the drone industry was on the rise as well. Um, technology, thanks mainly thanks to DJI, the price of it and adoption was going down. So a lot of more companies and a lot more customers could afford the technology that used to cost tens, hundreds of thousands. At the moment, just a fraction of the price back in 2017. So as we started doing more and more mapping projects, more um, larger scale projects, what we realized was, if you think about it, drones is just a camera on the sky to capture data. And that's where we, as the project got bigger, we started developing our own software and our own analytics platform called um, IRA Map, which of course you can check our website for it, to run through and chunk through big data analytics, mainly for the plantation sector. And why we focus on the plantation sector being based in Malaysia, this region, was we have huge oil palm plantations and these guys, they own massive amount of land. And what they had to do was to understand what's happening on the ground. And it's really the, the reason why we went into agriculture. It's not that we have experience in it. It's part of the entrepreneurship journey where I just took whatever opportunity that came along. And that's what we learned. Whatever solutions that we have on the market, listen to the customers, get the feedback from them, and just go into the industry. We will learn along the way. That's one of the key feedback that I got. So we deep dive into the agriculture sector in 2018. And we were doing a lot of mapping work um, covering up to a few million hectares over that year in terms of just analyzing, understanding what's happening on the ground. And we got to a point where we were very, having a very good relationship with the customers. And that, in a way, came our second breakthrough as a company where customers came to us and now they are telling us that, hey, with this geospatial data, it's really good that we understand what's happening on the ground now. But the basic fact is we can't take actions on it. And because of, they don't have labor. And it comes back to the main point, and I believe this is one of very important points about geospatial data. It's under, good to understand what's happening. But the bigger question is how do you take advantage and make use of the data? And that's where we transform the company from a pure analytics play company into an automation company as well, which we are today. So over that couple of years in 2017, 2018, that was when we spent a lot of money in R&D. And we came up with a much larger drone that could do very precise, what we call point-to-point -point spraying for the oil palm sector. And for those that are not familiar with the oil palm sector, if you look at the oil palm plantations, just everywhere, if you travel along the road, when you land at KIA Airport, you will see that it's all individual trees. It's not like crop, flat crops and all. And what that meant was to perform application of pesticide, fertilizer, and so on, you had to do it very precisely. 
And that's where the very interesting and the challenging part about merging automation, machinery, and geospatial data really came. And I was glad after about one and a half years of R&D, we managed to come up with our first drone that could do precise point-on-point -point spraying down to a precision level of about 15 centimeters. And that was a breakthrough for us and the industry. So that's where we are today. And what we saw at a very good timing as well when we launched the product, because COVID hit and there was a huge crunch on labor. And that's where the company went from. Last time it was like just a few people, about 20 of us. And right now within a year, we are at about 130, 140 people. So that's that whole leapfrog process that we have. But I think it won't take up too much time about talking about our journey. I think we'll cover a lot more and hear from the speakers later. But I think one key lesson that I learned along the way, it's really being one of the key traits of running a business is how to be opportunistic in a way that you can't frame your problem of your business or your business around what you think is on the market. You have to be open to listen to the customer feedback and very importantly, take action and be very opportunistic because you never know what's going to happen. Like no one expected COVID to happen. No one expected a lot of things to happen, but it's just going along with the flow and really making quick actions, taking actions along the way. All right. So that's a bit about what we do and my journey so far. Thank you. Well, that was terrific. And such a great point, even before uh, JX made that last point, I wrote down in my notes, don't fall in love with your own business idea, because more than half of CEOs and founders who start businesses, uh, they find that two, three, five years later, their business is something very different than it was when it started out. So just be ready for that terrific, terrific point. Thank you so much for that. All right, so we will uh, move on to the next speaker. And uh, Venkat Pile is CEO and founder of LatConnect60, a new space company established in 2019 out of Perth, Western Australia. Venkat drives the strategic vision and growth of LatConnect60 in providing leading edge earth observation satellite constellations, data and insights uh, and insights through uh, customized platforms to a wide range of industries. Prior to founding LatConnect60, Venkat developed over 12 years of experience as a consultant on Southeast Asian satellite missions, as well as program manager and system engineer on key Canadian and US satellite programs, such as the Radar, Radar Sat Constellation Mission, Cassiopeia, Polar Communications and Weather, and the DARPA CME mission. Venkat, let me call you up to the uh, podium. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I hope you're okay with me taking my mask off because it's a bit easier to breathe and talk. Um, thanks all for having me today. Um, I love the two talks before this. Uh, what we'll do today with, with my presentation is a bit different. It'll be a bit about the company a bit about myself, the startup journey, but also um, I'm probably the one of the only people who actually is a rocket scientist. I know the other two kind of talked about not being or not completing the aerospace uh, engineering degrees. And maybe just a quick aside on that is when I decided to do aerospace engineering, I remember it was right after high school, I was looking at college uh, applications and my dad said, why do you want to be an engineer? It's a dog's life. Uh, my dad himself was a you know, mechanical engineer by training. And he said, go and do a business degree, get an MBA. Don't do anything except engineering. I said, but why? I love I loved space and I love wanting to do something in aerospace. And he said, no, 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 you'll just work for somebody and you'll just, you know. Um, and, and to be honest, he was kind of right. <laughs> when I started out my degree, I actually did have to work for a number of people and, and for a number of years, but it taught me a lot. And I think um, just in terms of diversity of experience, but before you want to run a business, I think the first key step is do the nine yards. I know there's a lot of people who believe that they should come out right after university and run a startup. Uh, my advice is kind of the opposite. Do a number of years, do the hard work, move the boxes, do everything from, you know, 
making the coffees to taking the notes to do everything in between work for a small company small to medium enterprise if you can actually early on to get a feel for what it is to to run a startup business i mean i'll talk later a bit about myself i've done some startup investing myself in in early stage companies in software and tech and one thing i'll tell you is that some of the people and forgive me if i'm speaking out of tone for people who come from the mnc environment and that's the large corporation environment is when you're really steeped into these large organizations you don't quite understand uh, what's required to to scrounge and build a company from the ground up so if you are trying to build experience to potentially running your own business someday start with a small to medium enterprise and work your way to that organization you'll learn a lot uh, there's a lot of sweat equity there that I think will serve you well when you do come out and, and, and run your own business. So maybe just a bit about what Latkin X60 does. Um, so I've been in the space industry for a number of years and one of the key problems I saw in the industry was a lot of people building satellites and fancy satellites and constellations. There are a lot of companies that are doing the opposite end, which is, you know, insights, applications, ArcGIS based uh, tools and so on. But there was a gap in between. And the gap was, how do you get all that satellite data into an analytics ready format so that the wide user community can use? And it's not just about the data. The other issue that we found when we were listening to people was, was either overly priced or the end user license agreements for a lot of these satellite imageries was so prohibitive that people spend a lot of time just trying to figure that piece out before actually using satellite data. So uh, apologies if any of the big space companies are in the room here, but I, you've got to really relook at how you do end user licensing because it's a mess. Okay, so, so that's one of the key takeaways that I got very early in being in the industry is we had to do something a little bit different. So we built our business, our Lad Connect 60 was built around trying to plug a key gap. And the key gap was you've got all these satellites, you've got an end user community that wants the insights. How do you get it as seamless and analytics ready as possible um, at the right price point and with no end user license agreement? And that's really how uh, the company was born. So really from as a business, we're kind of satellite agnostic. Yes, we own our uh, part of a satellite. We said, okay, we need to have a satellite so we can generate our own data and drive the pricing and have no EULA because if we were to just buy data from everyone else, we'll be just a reseller. We're not changing the dynamics. So um, we currently co-own a, a satellite that Airbus launched. And interestingly enough, we provide the exact same data as what Airbus provides at one fifth the price with no EULA uh, and with all the data processing that we do at our team in-house in, in Perth. And, and we've got a subsidiary office here in in Malaysia. Um, and then we plan to build our own satellites and I'll get into that a bit later, but it, the, our model is to use what's already available, build on what's coming next um, and really focus our IP and capability around the middle bit, which is how do we automate that whole data processing at scale um, to generate insights ready data and then go one step further into specific end use case platforms, which could be uh, useful to specific uh, end users. So I learned very early in sort of my business career that don't be a solution looking for a problem. And that's what I think a lot of companies do is, uh, you know, I think as Kevin and others have said, you build these really nice solutions. You think it's the next big thing since, you know, slice bread. You put it out into the industry and then you find out, oh, we need a pivot. And I need another 10 million or 20 million to do that. Um, and and so not not every company is blessed with investors that are patient enough to to fund your pivot. So we were very um, deliberate in what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure we filled that gap and really hired the right team. Uh, and I heard team as being a core point here. I, I certainly agree. Getting the right team of people to ensure that we can really build that whole data integration piece and make that our own, make that our own secret sauce that uh, is very seamless, that enables us to have a, a pricing differential. And, and the two key areas that we actually focus on as a business is on generating insights for the agricultural markets. So your typical vegetation indices like NDVI, NDMI, for those of you who understand uh, those indices, where we generate all eight or more of these vegetation indices every month 
across millions of square kilometers of data using our own satellite and using uh, freely available data. And then we push that insights to any type of client, whether it be a drone company, an IoT company, or to end clients themselves. Um, and we've got a new platform as well that we are rolling out, which is on carbon monitoring. So looking at the forestry carbon store in uh, virgin forests, countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, tons uh, of, of carbon stores, that's one for the future. But enough about the company, I think maybe I'll just talk a little bit about myself and, and my own learning and, and, and how LAT Connect 60 kind of came into being. Um, like, you know, I mentioned, I, I worked for a large space company, uh, Magellan Aerospace, uh, and then I got seconded to MDA out of Canada and became program manager for the radar set constellation mission. And I learned a lot, like I said, working for other people, uh, helping them formulate their plans, generate business, uh, capture, you know, I've transitioned from being an engineer to being more of a business person uh, in sales and marketing, which a lot of people tend to bite their teeth when they hear, oh, you've become a sales and marketing guy. But no, I mean, sales and marketing is the lifeblood of any organization. I'll say that if you are thinking of building your own company in geospatial, get really good sales and marketing people, okay? If a, if a company is a kingdom, your sales and marketing people are your knights, okay? You've got to make sure they're well-trained, they're sharp, and they go out there and win your business. And so uh, that's something that, you know, cannot be compromised on. You need really good salespeople. Um, like I said, I, you know, I learned as well coming out of industry and, and investing in startups that are in the software space. And a key thing I learned is do or invest in businesses or capabilities that you are familiar with. I mean, I've made some frankly bad investment decisions with companies that I had no idea about. So if you don't understand the team, you don't understand what they're doing, you think it's cool, but it doesn't really have legs. You don't know how the, the, the business is being operated well. Don't go into it. Always start with what you know. I mean, I, I had a prior industry background in space, um, but by having that diversity of experience, it, it helped me to figure out what I wanted to do right in my space business. You know, so that's, it's important to have diversity in experience. Nothing is wrong, really, but you should generally try to look for areas where uh, you have some form of core information or core expertise that you can rely on. I think that's very important. Um, but that helped me uh, figure out what I wanted to do with Lad Connect 60. And when I met my co-founder, who's not a space geek at all, he's from the mining industry and uh, could be further away, furthest away from space. Um, and we got together and we founded the company. Um, we had a clear picture on how we wanted to position the company. And so we didn't go the typical VC route. I know a lot of companies go to venture caps. They pitch, they tell a good story. Uh, with us, it was really about how are we solving some key problems in the market? Um, and the VCs, a, a lot of them said, you know, but what's the core tech? What's the core tech that's going to be going to give me 100x on my investment? And I said, we'll get that 100x, but we'll get that 100x by building a sustainable business, not building something that we think is going to be really sexy and then you're going to have to raise a lot more money to kind of pivot. But you find that a lot of VCs think that way. Um, and because we were filling gaps in the industry um, and we were levering a lot of connections that, that we had from our prior working lives, it wasn't something that VCs were looking at, but certainly other private investors. So we've raised multiple rounds, uh, multi-million dollar rounds, which helped us uh, currently co-own our, our satellite and fund our next satellite purely by looking at the investors who invested in VCs, right? So what we had to do is a bit of research and say, who are the, who are the companies that, or who are the people that invest in VC funds? And they are high net worth, they are family offices, they are even hedge funds, frankly, that sit behind the venture cap and are putting money in. And we went to them and we said, this is what we are doing, this is how we're different. And we've been very successful in that actually, and we'll continue that. So, we, you know, fingers crossed we've been VC free and I think it's, uh, it's worked out well. We've had a lot of uh, autonomy by, by not having core VCs drive the way we do business. Um, if you're ever thinking of setting up a company and, and the Australian government is not paying me to say this, but Australia is a good place. Um, I just kind of move ahead. Um, just to give you a bit of background why we founded the company in Australia. 
Uh, Australia had a very clear vision about Earth observation in general. They've got very good roadmaps. They've got very good key organizations that will endorse you along the way. Uh, they have, I, you know, I think even if they went, they're not quick on giving you money, uh, they are certainly very useful in terms of giving you a lot of advice, endorsement, and enable you to actually go out there and close with your clients. So, for example, we built a very good relationship with the Australian Space Agency. Um, the head of the Australian Space Agency himself has endorsed some of the projects that, that we work on. Um, there are a lot of other very good Earth observation and geospatial related agencies like Geoscience Australia, Earth Observation Australia, that give companies a lot of guidance, including overseas companies that want to break into the Australian market. And we, of course, would be more than happy to work with any company that's looking to, to do stuff in Australia. Um, the other key thing, R&D tax incentives. I know, you know, key grants and support is from a financial perspective is always important, but um, getting R&D tax incentives is important, especially when you're a pre-revenue company. Uh, Australia is actually really good with that. Um, you know, for every dollar that we spent pre-revenue, we got close to 40% of that back in cash. Um, so that was actually a really good uh, support. Um, and um, the, other, the other key thing that, you know, um, which is interesting in about Australia is you've got a lot of smaller companies doing niche stuff, a lot of niche analytics, um, and, and most of them in Queensland. Um, and that's why having organizations like Earth Observation Australia are really good in kind of steering um, how, how the sort of businesses develop and, and grow in Australia. So a very good ecosystem to support uh, early to mid-stage companies. And really, there's a last slide on us as a business and where we're looking to go next. Um, we are investing in our own satellites. Um, we recently raised money to build a constellation of hyperspectral imaging satellites. Uh, we're starting our first satellite out with the exact same bands as Sentinel-2. So if any one of you are familiar with Sentinel data sets, uh, they are 20 meter resolution. We are looking to be you know, 20 times better resolution and at a fraction of the cost that you pay for one meter resolution. Uh, so it's not free, but it's certainly um, close enough, close enough to, to free that you're not gonna feel a pinch. Um, we've got a lot of good support on this from the Australian government, space agency and state governments. And, and our, really our goal is to have a constellation of this across the region. So particularly if you're doing a lot of uh, work in, you know, whether it's drone, IOT or geospatial in general across Southeast Asia, um, we plan to tune a lot of these satellites to focus on the near equatorial countries uh, to deal with the heavy cloud cover and actually get some good imagery across uh, in between the clouds. So um, that's it for me. Um, thank you for having me. Great. Cheers. Thank you. Terrific. So many good points uh, in that presentation, Venkat. And I know most of you are thinking I'm going to seize on his point about how important sales and marketing are, but I'm going to let that, that one go by because it was another really important point he made about <clears throat> people starting businesses and giving away too much, too big a percentage of the business early on to VCs or other investors. And then they find later on they have to pivot and they need more money and they have to give away another chunk of the business. And the next thing they know, they find they're no longer in control of the business because they've given away or not given away, but sold 60%, you know, more than 50%, in other words. And uh, this happens all the time. So really, really good point. Um, all right. So we'll move on to our final presenter. I'm going to ask uh, Rakshit Bhatt. Uh, to come to the podium. He is one of the co-founders and the vice president of computing at Galaxy Space of India, an organization which aims to provide the most meaningful satellite data at high resolution captured using their constellation of multi-sensor smart satellites. Rakshit leads Galaxy's efforts in the development of their data products, as well as edge computing unit to facilitate real-time insights. Uh, graduated from Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. He comes with a rich background in data science and has developed AI-based systems for one of the world's leading, leading corporations. He strongly believes that realizing the true potential of satellite data can provide insights and solutions to humanity's biggest challenges. Rakshit, please come up.
Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. Yeah, good evening, everyone. And uh, it was it's really an honor to be part of this panel. And uh, um, my fellow panelists, you you guys have shared a lot about your journeys uh, from uh, which I'm sure a lot of uh, us can take inspiration from. Um, today, I want to share something different. Um, I'm sure a lot of us sitting in this room have thought about building a startup of our own, you know, or building a business of our own. Um, but at some point due to some challenges or, you know, uh, we, we must have felt that, uh, we are not mature enough or, you know, we don't have enough technical knowledge or, uh, maybe this is just too much for us. Something would have, um, something would have uh, held us from uh, doing that, right? So today I want to share Galaxy's journey, right? How uh, a bunch of individuals came together and, uh, you know, wanted to start a business of their own. And uh, I hope, to, I really hope that this journey will uh, inspire a lot of you to start your own businesses, right? So um, to begin with, what is Galaxy, right? So I think this one line summarizes what Galaxy is and is wanting to do building smartest digital twin of the earth, right? So what is a di digital twin exactly? So, um, digital twin is a digital representation of any physical object, right? Um, so what do we mean by the smartest digital twin, right? We want to give more and more information, digital information about the physical object, right? And how exactly are we going to do this? Yeah. So this is our solution. We are building a very special kind of sensor called as Drishti sensor, right? So Drishti sensor is going to have the capabilities of both a synthetic aperture radar and an optical camera, right? So it means that for uh, any object on the ground, we are going to get radar data as well as an optical data. So this is why we call it the smartest digital twin. But not only this, we all know that, um, satellite data is extremely different from any other type of data because it's extremely different to manage the data when it comes to data processing. Right. And the, another major, uh, setback that a lot of satellite data providers are facing is that the satellites are limited in, um, the amount of data that they can download back to earth. Right. So when we say that we are going to have, uh, multiple sensors on our satellite, it also means that we would need to manage this data on the edge, right? And that's why we have decided to put up edge computing units on our satellite. These edge computing units will not only help us do efficient data management, but also uh, help us provide insights on the edge. So yeah, both of these solutions combined will give us an efficient constellation of satellites orbiting the earth. Right. So how this all began. So, um, I'm going to go back to my college days and this kind of started, uh, um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about this, uh, competition that SpaceX or Elon Musk used to conduct called as SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition. Right. So, um, five of us, we came, so we are five co-founders by the way, who co-founded Galaxy and, um, 
all of us kind of met in college and uh, we were pretty fascinated about building you know a uh, hyperloop pod that can you know travel at around 1000 kilometers per hour and uh, we wanted to take part in this competition and it was just our sheer love of technology that brought us together we did not have any business background or we did not have any experience in leading teams or making strategies right but what we were we were technologists we know how to develop a technology right so that's what we focused on and uh, we got a lot of support from our institute we got a lot of support from our alumni and we were able to go into spacex hyperloop pod competition in 2019 in fact we were the only finalists there from asia that year right so um this is how we kind of uh, met right but at that time we really had no idea at all that we are going to uh, you know go into the uh, sp- we we are going to you know co-found a space tech venture called galaxy and we kind of went into our own separate ways unless something else happened which is covid uh, which uh, gave us a lot of time uh, to take our heads out of our corporate jobs or our colleges you know and start discussing on uh, is there something else that we can do is there something else we can explore right and uh, one of us was very smart uh, he was smart enough to look at the uh, you know uh, data and see that uh, the space market is projected to become a multi billion dollar market in uh, the next few years in fact it already is becoming that right so uh, he proposed that why not explore the space right this space so we're like yeah fine and uh, we started out as an uh, by doing analytics right we started out so uh, we understood that there are a lot of different verticals which have problems that can be addressed by satellite imagery right so just like agriculture or uh, asset monitoring change detection all these things right so we started out developing these vertical specific solutions right and we went into the market we showed these solutions to our customers right we also talked to other bunch of analysts who do the same thing right so um, at this point we came to a realization that for these analysts the bigger problem is the data itself they are not getting the right data right for people who worked with optical images the problem was that uh, let's say you take an example of vietnam right uh, a lot of areas are covered by clouds most of the time right so uh, these people have to wait for about a couple of months to get the right optical image for their area of interest right uh, sar is really uh, a pinnacle of sensor technology right you can get uh uh a sar image during the day or night or in any weather right but the problem that people were having with sar image is the interpretability they were not under, able to understand that okay i i know that this this is a car and this looks like uh, a square object in optical but i'm not sure how where a car is in sar image right so we understood that these two data sets are not competing but complementary and that's where the idea to have both of them on the same satellite originated from right so um, yeah so we explored the space right started with an analytics company but pivoted to a data provider company and then yeah that's where we found our group right so the next important part once you have a good idea is how do you actually get the funding right to build prototype or to you know uh, do lab testings all the stuff right so uh, i think we were lucky because our institute uh, provided a lot of support in terms of incubation in terms of facility in terms of guidance right and uh, to begin with we got uh, a lot of grant money from the government as well government of tamil nadu um, as well as the incubation cell and eventually uh, we were gaining gaining enough traction to catch the eye of uh, a uh, space venture capital from india called as special invest and from there we raised our pre seed funding in 2021 yeah so a little bit about the team so as i said that uh, there are five of us which is uh, not very common to see in uh, the startups right but that's how we are different like all of us uh, complement each other in a very nice way and uh, we kind of have that uh, coordination between us because we have previously worked with building uh, you know hyperloop technology we love tech we absolutely 
uh, font to you know develop uh, uh, fascinating technologies that can solve great problems. So I think that kind of brings us all together. And yeah. So, but uh, one of the key challenges that you face, you know, when you go to people and you tell them that okay, uh, we are five co-founders, we have this background, and we want to solve problems. You know, this is a problem. We want to build satellites. People people will say that you can't do it, right? Five of us, five of you can't build a satellite. So we are like, okay, five of us can't. So we need a team of engineers, right? And so the next most important step was to build a good team, right? So that's when we went out and we are now a team of 30 plus engineers who are working day in and day out to solve this problem. Right. So, yeah, um, I think another important thing apart from the idea or the funding is actually the timing, right? So a lot of good ideas, uh, do not go to the market because their, their, their timing is wrong. Right. And we have heard this a lot of times, right? So how do we actually know whether the timing is right or not? How do we know that, okay, we have an idea and it's the right time to, uh, you know, uh, start to make a business out of this. Right. So I think, uh, a very simple answer to that is follow that domain or follow the news in that domain, follow that space. Right. So, uh, this is how we came to know that this is the right time. The space ecosystem is evolving and not just in India, but globally. Right. So the first, uh, first, uh, excerpt that, that you see in this slide is that, uh, uh, the Indian government is actually, uh, pushing for an interface between ISRO and the, uh, commercial space tech companies. Right. Uh, uh as we all know, ISRO is one of the big four in, uh, you know, big four space organizations of the world. And they just, they don't want to, uh, be very inclusive. They want other people to use uh, the testing facilities or the technologies that they have developed. And that's, that's what government wants to do as well. They want to push the, uh, push ISRO to make sure that these, uh, technologies are made available to the aspiring, uh, space tech companies in the country. Right. Second thing is the launch costs are going down drastically. This thing we have seen in the last, uh, five years, 10 years, right. Uh, starting from Falcon. And now Elon Musk claims that the starships will be uh, you know, what, like five X, 10 X less five X, five X, 10 X cheaper than the current launch costs. Right. So I think this is a huge enabler for people to launch more and more satellites into space. Uh, another thing is that, uh, you know, in the light of the recent events, uh, especially the Russia, Ukraine war, uh, there were a lot of data providers that circulated the images of Ukraine and that helped public understand the extent of damages that were caused by Russia. Right. So, uh, the world is slowly realizing the importance of satellite data, be it to fight the climate change, be it for national security or be it for other applications. Right. And this really installs confidence in the investors as well. Right. A lot of big VCs, uh, they're also following this and they know after looking at this, that, uh, uh, uh the business space business is going to get a huge boost. Right. And, uh, just to compliment, uh, just to compliment it, you can see on the right, uh, uh, the person is S Somnath and he is the chairman of ISRO and only a few days back, he visited our office to help, uh, find a few, uh, areas where we can partner with them. Yeah. So what's next for us, um, in, so as I talked about, we are building an indigenous, uh, sensor called as Drishti sensor, which will have the capabilities of both SAR and optical sensor. And that's something we are going to test this quarter, right? Uh, we have planned multiple airborne tests this quarter and, uh, yeah. And, uh, we are going to collaborate with a lot of people like you, uh, who can then, you know, use that data to solve a lot of problems in different verticals. And, uh, next year we want to take this sensor, put it up on the satellite and launch it uh, you know, by the end of December or the start of, uh, 2024, right. And eventually by 2027, we want to have a constellation of 15 satellites that can give a uh, revisit of, uh, four times in a day. So that's what's next for us. Yeah. And eventually after that, we want to be the eyes and brains in space. So not just limited to, uh, uh, you know, helping, uh, data scientists on earth or geospatial analysts on earth, 
but uh, we want to push the human race beyond earth right and for that we want to explore other planets and uh, understand that where can humanity sustain in the future yeah thanks Excellent. And uh, just a quick comment on, uh, again, he had so many great points, but I hope you noticed how he started out his presentation talking about what was what's different about Galaxy. And that's really important when you're, well, it's really when you're trying to sell to a customer and trying to uh, talk to a potential investor, the first thing they're going to ask is what's different? What's your unique selling proposition? So he did a great job of explaining that. So uh, that said, we're going to go ahead and uh, and open it up to uh, Q and A. And um, anybody have uh, questions for for any of the speakers? Thank you very much for the great uh, presentation, all of the presenter. I have one question regarding the VCs. It was mentioned that Philip. Uh, do not go to VC directly. They will take a lot of uh, shares from your company. Uh, right now, I'm in that position right now. The VCs are contacting, asking for a lot of shares of the company and asking that when they can exit. They, they need to exit. And I'm saying that I'm not going to sell the company. It is my baby. I'm going to stay with this company until I'm alive. And they say, okay, I'm not going to invest in that company. So how did you go to the behind this VC uh, company? How did you find the source? How did you find those people? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. So, so I knew I was going to get a lot of flack for that, uh, for that <laughs> comment. But uh, no, it, it, look, I mean, so maybe caveat, I'm not saying don't go to VCs, but there are different, as I say, horses for courses. It depends on what the VC, the alignment of the VC or the investor is with your business. I mean, so, frankly, there's nothing wrong with an investor taking a large portion of your company if that investor is in alignment with you business-wise and can do more than just provide money. So if the investor can provide connections, access to market, uh, really help you scale. Um, but, you know, at the same time, some of the problems I have with investors is when they have that question about how am I going to get my 100x on day one, which is kind of the question you're saying. Uh, then the problem is you've got to ask yourself whether that investor is really in it to align and help you grow, or is this an investor that's going to come in and buy out a huge chunk of your company, shape it into something that the investor thinks is attractive, and then flip it either through a public listing or through an M&A uh, mergers and acquisition to somebody else uh, uh, within a year or two, right? I mean, this is something that is happening. Um, we've seen it actually with some of the space companies that have gone for SPAC listings recently on the NASDAQ. A lot of them have dropped quite significantly in market cap because uh, the brokers and the VCs ended up making all the money, the founders, not so much. Uh, so it really depends on what you want, but there's no right or wrong answer. And I'm not saying don't go to VCs, but be very careful if you do with the type of VC you align with and whether that's the right fit. I don't know if anyone else has a comment on this. Maybe, maybe I'll add a bit more to it because we are VC backed. And uh, we actually started, I think one difference about us as a vc back company was we actually started off without any external funding and we ran sustainably for around five years before we decided to take on VC funding. And that really made us very different, build a very different culture in our team compared to a lot of companies that day one, you know, idea on a paper, they went out and they started raising funds. Um, I think to summarize the main difference in culture, right? between our team and a lot of companies that raise funds from day one is there is this sense of abundance of resources for companies that raise from day one. And what I mean by that, it's, it's always, you solve problems by just throwing money at it because you know at the back of your mind that you're always able to raise more and more and more. And that's what in a way, I think a lot of VC wants you to build that culture because it works for the VC um, where the more you have to raise, the more they are able to basically get you to dilute or invest more into your company 
and get more ownership. So I think what, what we learned and what we did, I think, well, was not raising too early. And I think this is something that a lot of companies should try and avoid. Um, exhaust all your kind of, in every country around the world, I think most countries around the world, um, there is a lot of entrepreneurship programs, accelerators, startup programs, government grants, and so on. Try and exhaust every single thing first before going on to that external investor route. Because those guys, um, again, there are a lot of good ones out there, but there's also an equal amount of like not so good ones that may take advantage. Yeah, so I raised two hundred million dollars so far. <laughs> so I yeah, but I touched so many uh, VCs and uh, the companies and the institutional uh, investors as well. So I think uh, the company has the face, uh, appropriate face to touch the appropriate uh, investors. So uh, the yeah, venture capitals, I think they are, yeah, of course. Uh, how can I say their actual value is. Uh, supporting the marketing and also, uh, yeah, otherwise in early stage of the startup. So that's actual their value. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the mission uh, alignment is very important with, yeah, with startup companies. So yeah, we should select very carefully the right partner, not investor partners for our beginning phase. They can bet uncertainty. So uh, in this early stage, I think uh, VC is right, partner. And then next stage, we want to, how can I say, become uh, to uh, want to uh, make the long-term strategic partner. So in this phase, uh, the, how can I say, industrial uh, investors is very good for us to support our POC or service like that. And then in later stage, institutional investors, yeah, join. So I, yeah, so in my, uh, experience. So this, yeah, each of the stage have the have separate investors. Thank you. Okay. Rakshit, did you, you're the only one that hasn't weighed in on this. <laughs> it's a great question, by the way. Yeah, I think uh, my fellow panelists have pretty much uh, made it all made all the good comments. So I'll still uh, it's it's a trade off with the VC, right? Uh, you, you have to think from their point of view, you view as well that uh, they are there to make a good exit, right? So they would want to get greedy and they would want to exit your company. Uh, like it's different from, from for different VC, depends on which PC you are in talks with. Some of them might want to exit early. Some of them might want to exit late, right? Uh, I think first thing is, uh, someone already mentioned that just check if you if the capital that you need is what only a VC can provide, right? Because there are a lot of accelerators and incubators that can provide you the capital as well as the resource as well. Right. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, if you are going with the VC, check that it aligns with, you know, what your company's objective is. You might want to look at their portfolio and, uh, check whether they have other companies in their portfolio that can help collaborate with you and accelerate you. Right. So you are giving them some equity, but that is also help you, uh, accelerate, you know, maybe, uh, accelerate by a couple of years, right? If you don't take VCs help, you might not be where you are in a couple of years, right? So it's a trade-off and you want to put down a lot of parameters, pros and cons, and then see where you are, what you need, right? Uh, is there an alternate to this, right? It's, it's not exactly uh, a one line answer, right? Thank you very much. So I understood your point that one of the points is to choose the VCs which are aligned with the, with the mission of the company. So in this case, we are interested in a space and aerospace. One of them is that do not go to investment too early. So maybe Buddhist therapy would be doing some sort of Buddhist therapy in the beginning. And then also considering the institution, uh, institutional investors as well. Thank you very much. So for sure, it brings more questions in my mind right now, but I would leave the space and time to other things. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add a little earlier, I mentioned that in 2020, we did a virtual uh, presentation on uh, geospatial startups. And a big part of that was uh, how to look for and how to pitch to investors. 
Um, I'll try, it was recorded. So I'll try to repost that maybe on my LinkedIn uh, page next week. If you all at the end want to get my card and, you know, link in with me, that would be great. And I'll try to get it up there and you can watch. It was an hour long uh, uh, webinar. So it was quite good. So uh, great. And, you know, I want to ask a question because the, the term um, accelerator incubator was just mentioned. And really, we didn't talk about that much during the presentations. And I, I'm curious um, in, in Asia, uh, the Asia Pacific region, um, are there a lot of uh, business accelerators and are there any that are specific to the geospatial industry? We're starting to see that elsewhere in the world. I take your time. Okay. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, how can I say in, yeah, geospatial sector uh, doesn't have the, uh, maybe I cannot say this in IRS, but the, yeah, in, yeah, geospatial sector, I think doesn't have the uh, good yeah, incubation program. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's, it's located in country or right. data sector mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, specific company. So maybe like uh, Google, AWS, and yeah. have a good incubation. So uh, yeah, in this, how can I say ecosystem, I, I think, yeah, it yeah it doesn't have the yeah, appropriate yeah. yeah scheme. I think so. yeah, something that would be nice to try to get started. I mean, uh, Amazon Web Services uh, they've they've started several accelerators. I know one of one of them is space related. I don't know if they've mm -hmm. got one specifically geospatial related, but a lot of geospatial companies go through the uh, the AWS Amazon Web Services. Um, so. Yeah, interesting. So, so the Asia Pacific region could use that. Yeah. Yeah, I think for from Malaysia or the countries that have been around, I don't think there is any specific geospatial accelerator. But to me, that's not the point at all, because the whole purpose of an accelerator is to help you start and run the company. And if you look at it and you break down every single business, the fundamental values are exactly the same. You have to generate revenue to get the, you need to provide value and get customers in. And that's how you fund your business. Mm -hmm. So be it a geospatial business or a online trading business, e-commerce business, and so on. Fundamental principles, how you build the team, how you build your business model, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of great accelerators out there in the region. And I think any of them, if you find that you work well with the team, the group of mentors, it can be right for you. Okay. Great. Ben Cat, you want to add chime, something to that? Chime in on that. Uh, yeah. To just give a slightly uh, um, aligned but yet different perspective. Australia, I think one of the key points there is they are very focused on accelerators there. Geospatial is a key theme in Australia. As Great. I mentioned, there is a community roadmap. And so what happens generally is when there's more awareness about a particular industry segment, like in Australia, there's they actually value geospatial quite highly because it's a very large landmass. There's a lot of resource companies, uh, fire, flood, all those kinds of things come into play. And so um, there is an aspect of geospatial in other accelerators. So there's right. no like actual accelerator for geospatial, but geospatial is a theme within accelerators across Australia. Um, but, but I think what JX is saying is important about the fundamentals, right? I think that I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and that's what accelerators are there to support a business. doesn't matter what type of tech business you are. Um, where I think some accelerators might be a bit better positioned, those who are looking at geospatial, is that they may have links to um, end users, whether it be government or commercial, that would get a geospatial solution a bit better than perhaps mm -hmm. something that's completely out of left field. So that's probably the only area where if there is an accelerator that has a geospatial flavor to it, it might make sense uh, to be part of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so talking about accelerators, um, in India, I don't think there are a lot of geospatial accelerators but at the same time, a lot of universities in India have incubators. So an example is the IIT Madras Research Park. It's, uh, it's sort of not a part of the university. It carries the name of IIT Madras, but 
it's an independently operating body and uh, if you have an idea you go to them you pitch them you might not be from the same institute right you can be from anywhere you can pitch them and yeah uh, they'll charge you some equity probably but in return you get uh, you get to carry the institute's name you get to use the uh, faculty of the institute for advisory mentorship right you get to use a lot of uh, technical facilities in the institute as well right um capital is not that intensive right as you might get in an accelerator but yeah uh, across a lot of universities in india you might find these incubators and you might want to check them out if you want to start up um the second thing is uh, uh, i know kevin specifically talked about the asia pacific but uh, there are a lot of good accelerators in the uh, north american region as well and mm-hmm. the best part about uh, a lot of these accelerators are they are agnostic to from which country you are coming from if you have a great idea right so you should not shy away from checking checking them out and if you do have a good idea you please do approach them and apply there yeah great point good i think there was another question out there yeah Hello. So uh, everyone mentioned team being key in, in getting funding and, and getting on with designing something. Uh, I'm in a situation where myself and a friend enjoy designing something and we're looking to take that into being business. But we know that the two of us by ourselves probably won't be able to raise funding uh, because we haven't really got a rounded team. Uh, now, meeting good engineers isn't a problem for us, but we've found that meeting good, good engineers who are also a social fit is the issue. So I was wondering how you all found co-founders or good engineers that you got on with as well, because when you're sitting in a room for 16 hours a day, <laughs> it's helpful to just like share a sense of humor, I suppose. That's, that's a good question. Uh, any, anybody dealt with that? Um, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, so um especially when you talk about space tech uh geospatial industries finding engineers with the relevant skill is is a very uh difficult problem um and especially like anywhere in the world finding engineers with good social skills would be a challenge um i think uh team building is one thing for which you have to give a lot of time and you have to have a lot of patience i think that's very important uh uh the first thing that i that comes to my mind when it comes to you know uh so so there are two parts to it right first thing as you mentioned is uh finding co-founders right and the second thing second part of it is building a good team right so i think uh to find the right co-founder you just have to network 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 right network talk to them about your idea see their enthusiasm see their background see their passion right uh, it's very very difficult to find a right and good co-founders we were lucky enough to found each, find each other right uh, but yeah it's it's one of the difficult parts of starting up so right so i think for that i would just say network network and network uh, to build the right team i think first of all you should have a right uh, structure to hire someone i think that's very important you should sit back and understand that what kind of culture do you want in your team right what kind of skill sets do you want in your team right and you should design a recruitment process with stages or structure that complements that very well right and you stick to this right go on platforms go to universities uh uh like reach out to more and more people in events like uh, igars right and you just like keep following that structure until you know someone uh breaks through uh passes all your tests right and then you work with them for some time think about whether they have actually been what you have thought uh you, you know they are the kind of person that you wanted in your team right and if not then you revise this structure follow it again right so this is the kind of process that we have followed and it has taken time right it has taken over a year to build a really good team right uh, there there are instances where people will leave you there are instances where people will stick with you right even though uh, when you are low when you are down right so you'll encounter you'll uh, get all kinds of people following this process but you be patient 
take time and keep evolving this process of uh, recruitment. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get one. Did anybody want to add to that before we go to the next question? I, I just maybe very quickly want to just uh, chime in and say how, how important is it, or maybe ask the question a different way, how important is it for you to have engineers in the exact area of expertise that you need, or can you broaden the scope to engineers in general? Sure, perf so, that, so that's perfect, right? So oftentimes when you broaden the scope, and if you're not hung up on that person actually being an engineer as well, you find a lot of uh, uh, people who uh, might surprise you. Uh, case in point, Lutfi, who's our head of Malaysian ASEAN sitting in the middle, he's not an engineer, but he's learned up everything about geospatial analytics in under a year. And I think you've got a bit of a sense of humor, don't you? So <laughs> I think you're all right. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. This question is exclusive for Rakshas. Uh, you have uh, five, your company has five co-founders. So what are the major challenges when you uh, discuss amongst all the co-founders and how did you resolve it? Because being a single uh, founder, okay, this is, this is me and I'm going to plan it, execute it and uh, delegate the responsibility. But when we are five on the same table, then definitely some challenges comes out. Yeah, I think that's mm. a great question. Mm -hmm. oh, let me think. <laughs> no, uh, I think one thing that's really good amongst us is that we all have complementing skill sets, right? So let's say uh, talking about Suyash, he has some corporate experience, right? So he understands corporate uh, corporate practices very well, right? If, if this thing has to be done in a corporate way, how will you do it, right? Or uh, if you want to approach a corporate enterprise for something, right? He knows their behavior, right? Uh, when it comes to me, I have some experiences building AI solutions, right? Or uh, related to computing, right? So if any decisions have to be has to be taken on that particular front, uh, I back myself, right? I back my decisions, and they appreciate it. Right. So there is this coordination where each of us have a very complementing set of skills and the other four know that, okay, this guy sort of has a good background in working in this particular domain and he's backing himself up. Of course, it's not as easy, right? There is a lot of uh, data that one has to put forth and then other four are being extremely critical, right? About it. In fact, like other four go, go with a mindset that this is not going to work. Right. But, and you have to prove all four of them wrong. Right. So we have a lot of these internal discussions sometimes. Yeah. Like there is, there is also a little, little bit of a quarrel regarding a few decisions that you have to make. Right. But we also have a bunch of advisors, right. If, if we are sort of in a deadlock, we go to those advisors, we ask them, right. What do you think is the right uh, option? And they uh, give us with data, which will then help us to, you know, kind of get out of this deadlock. Right. So I think, uh, I hope that kind of answers your question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Tess. Thank you so much for the sharing today. Um, I have a question specifically for Dr. Moto. So you mentioned that you started uh, the company in 2018 and to date it's about four years and you basically doubled the team and 10x the amount of funding within this period of time. And it's during the very severe COVID period, right? And you also share about the three factors in a successful um, company, right? The first one being team building. How do you bring your team through these very hard times during COVID and more so being able to deliver that 10x in funding? So yeah, thanks. Okay, so, uh, yeah, especially during COVID situation, I, not I, only I, but there's actually our hiring team, uh, how can I say, already have the know-how to hire 
uh, to have the job interview online, by online, before COVID. Because we have to, how can I say, hire so many talent uh, from global market. So the first or have a, the all of job interview are conducted by the online place. So uh, for the hiring, uh, we utilize that. And uh, for finance, but I think almost same. Uh, for finance, uh, yeah, so basically all meeting uh, done by the yeah, online meeting. And uh, so actually uh, several yeah, investors, uh, I have not seen them in person so far. But uh, I think uh, COVID uh, situation brings some of the good point. Uh, it's easy to, how can I say, have the meeting, first meeting, door opening. So uh, that every people, uh, all people, uh, how can I say, used to the, have their online meeting every in the world. And uh, yeah, jet, how can I say, uh, the time lag, not uh, jet lag, but the time difference is only the problem, but uh, you can arrange the online meeting in anywhere, uh, any world, uh, place in the world. So, uh, so basically we did the, everything by the online the meeting. And uh, yeah, so I think it's yeah, completely changed before COVID. Makes sense. Do you have a secret to success to holding your team together, being apart and being mm -hmm. having all the meetings online, right? Not seeing each other in person. Key point. The secret. She wants the secret. You know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so the so actually so we so all of you joined uh since perspective by. Yeah, have the online meeting, right? Yeah, so maybe they know. Oh, but, uh, yeah. Oh, really? Why are you still Hi, my, my name is Sebastian. I'm, I work for Synspective and I'm part of the marketing team, but I'm also involved in the team in team spirit of our company. Um, so I think I can answer this question a little bit. Um, so the thing what we do is during online meetings. Uh, so when I joined the company, we I got assigned a, a person that was already working in the company to have like a weekly meeting. So that already kind of indicates of like how we're doing at home and because we, when you're at home, you're not with your colleagues, so it's kind of hard to connect. Um, so we start off with a buddy uh, in the beginning and uh, my buddy was and I were pretty close. So we kept going for like a year and a half now already. And uh, what other things that we do is I'm part of uh, a program called, that we call capital matching and which means that uh, anyone can sign up for this program. And once a month you get signed up with a random person in the company from a completely different team. Um, to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and then you can just go out for lunch or have a, an online, online session as well to, to make sure that you can you can have a conversation with someone you usually don't talk to because usually you stick to your own team right or for instance like the marketing team barely speaks with the people who actually make the satellites so in order to break that barrier we kind of developed this program and then on top of that we tried now that the COVID situation is calming down a little bit we're trying to meet more in person and uh, once a month we have a meeting and afterwards you do a kind of a, like a drinky party so uh, one of the th key things is probably to get a, a beer fridge at work that definitely helps <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I think that's a uh, uh, one of the key things to do is like since it's hard to still meet in big groups at least get the one-on-ones going and get matched up randomly and i think that's the way to go and uh, yeah that kind of was, I was kind of going to ask a question about this to the other three uh, panelists, uh, how you guys do things with in terms of team building. So I was kind of curious about that. I hope I answered your question, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. How do you team build? When, when a company like all of you have, have so many different types of job functions within the company that people who probably out in the you know bigger world don't interact with each other. That's that's really an interesting uh, topic. Yeah, well, team building during COVID was particularly difficult, <laughs> but uh, do everything from online games to uh, watching movies together. I think really just just be friends, to be honest. I mean, I think you can develop a lot uh, of interpersonal relationships by doing stuff that's got nothing to do 
with the business and just tune out and do completely different things, talk about interests, hobbies, um, do hobbies together, potentially in, in subgroups. We did some of that online. Now that they actually, the teams can meet up together, we've had, we've flown out our KL people to, to Perth and our Perth people to KL. And we've done, you know, it's kind of sightseeing uh, tours together. Uh, it's just fun. It's just, you know, I think just getting out there and, and you know, uh, doing stuff that's out of the routine uh, for us actually really works and it just eases up everybody. Yeah, I think I would like to raise one important point. Hello. Yeah. So um, uh, the question here was like, how do you manage these uh, big teams, right? was the question. So, uh, usually you don't get a team of 200 people in a day, right? It's a gradual thing, right? First you have your 10, first 10 employees, then 20, then 50, then maybe hundred and then 200, right? Uh, as a co-founder, right. Uh, or as a team, right. You sit and decide, uh, what kind of culture do you want to build, right? Going further. And you try to practice this and install these, uh, qualities in your first layer of employees. Right. So, uh, I think as you guys rightly pointed out, uh, it's very hard for someone like Dr. Moto to interact with every person in his team. Right. But you can interact with the first layer, right? Those early employees, you can cultivate or, you know, understand them on how do they, you know, uh, forward this culture that you guys have built up together, right? So eventually what's going to happen, they'll pass on uh, that information or that knowledge to the next 20. And then eventually the 200 of uh, you would be, you know, sort of have the same mentality, right? So currently we don't have a team of 200 people. We have around 30 plus people and uh, I'm a very outdoor person, right? In fact, a lot of us are very outdoor person. So we uh, go for activities like bowling, karting, you know, uh, uh, we love to play soccer, right? So once a while, all of us gather together, play soccer, all those things. Right. So I think, uh, but it, where my thinking is coming from is that I have something in mind for, you know, the culture I want to set up in my team going forward when we become a team of 200 people. Right. And I won't be able to interact with every 200 of them by myself, but these 30 people would be able to right? So I want to cultivate this, um, culture with them. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just add on a bit on what Rakshit said. I hundred percent agree that you do need a strong team of promoters in a way that you set up that core team and they really drive with your culture. And the way we see it, it's, it needs, the culture needs to be very clear. Number one, listed down. And more importantly, it needs to be actionable plus shown in every single leadership team, not just the co-founders, but everyone in, in the point where it's not just as simple as showing the cultures and um, just presenting it, but it's about making structural changes to the entire evaluation process, your one-to-one -one process. For example, we have our seven core values. When we do annual performance, our one-to-ones and meetings and so on, everything is all based back to the culture and the core values that we have. And that gives everyone that kind of sense of belonging and feeling that they are part of something bigger as a company. Now, of course, during COVID, it was, that was what kept us together. Plus, yeah, a lot of online games, events, and just random things. Because to be honest, during COVID, you just couldn't meet each other. Uh, right now, it's different where you we organize events, or like bowling, whatever it is. But during COVID, yeah, I think it was like just a lot of games, Friday night games, um, just random things. But obviously now going back to a partial normal, um, we, we took away a lot of the games and did it with physical activities instead. <laughs> I think I'm okay. Man. Thank you. Yeah. Very much. Thank you very much. That's great. And it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, and I think in the United States, um, the big thing is uh, sports teams 
which several of you alluded to, um, company softball teams, soccer teams, uh, volleyball teams are popular. I guess they're getting popular again now that COVID is uh, on its way out. So, um, so we're a little over time. If, if anybody has one last question, we can take that. Otherwise, you can, there we go. Go, go ahead. What, what do you have to? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a, a super fascinating uh, workshop. Um, so, so my question is uh, is with respect to the customer. So, Venkat, I believe you mentioned um, to be aware of of VCs, especially. Sorry to hammer on the point again, but just in in the sense of, but specifically about you don't know what solution um, you know you're looking for. You have to pivot. You have to iterate towards that, right? So. Uh, rather than building one sort of uh, super solution, committing all your resources to that, uh, I imagine you know you you need to iterate and, and and pivot frequently, and hopefully have enough funding to get there before your company fails. So so my question then is just with respect to like working with customers, like, like I imagine it would be it would be nice at a very early stage to to be able to um, interact with customer, have a good relationship where you can be. You can say, hey, we have a prototype we're working on. We'd like to, you know, we think you could use the data, you know, um, could we, will you work with us and we'll give you free, you know, these kinds of partnerships with customers so you can, so you can get instant feedback and, and uh, pivot quickly. So I guess um, my question to, to all of you or some of you is, is just like how, how to establish that relationship, you know, especially when, um, Maybe you're outside of the industry and it's an old industry that's hard to break into. For example, like mining, you know, large companies that, you know, with, with old ways. But uh, sorry, my question is too long, but just, just basically about the customer and how you iterate quickly with them from an early stage as sort of an outsider, if you have any advice towards that or how important that is or if it's not important. Yeah, I want to add that that is such a crucial question and related to it, um, and I'll throw this in there, is... When you're a startup, a lot of times you're starting your business and you don't actually have a product yet. Like you don't have a satellite up, you don't have data. And um, what do you do then? And that that is really a, uh, a challenge. So that's kind of related to the same question. So go ahead, you guys take it away. I'll start and I probably won't have all the answers. So um, we've got the rest of the panel to back me up here. But um, I, I face very similar problems i'd say initially when when um when i started let connect 60 or even prior to that um you know i was like i said invested in a software startup that initially was a solution looking for a problem and it was difficult because we spent a lot of money um just to digress a bit we created this multi-touch platform which is basically like you've seen the movie minority report uh, and what tom cruise had on the screen that was effectively the 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 platform uh, and so someone could be working on Microsoft Word, another one PowerPoint, da da da, and you could all work on the same multi-touch screen together. And if you like something, you could just flip it across and you know, raise a lot of eyebrows. A lot of people were excited by that, um, but it didn't have very. It had very little customer interaction, and and so that's when we realized that we were actually just doing this completely the wrong way around because. We developed something, we went out and we were demoing this with DBS Bank and Accenture and Rio Tinto and all of these big boys. And we were constantly changing the design, but we'd already spent so much money and time on building the core product that we actually had to stick a step back and say, hang on a minute, if we just went out with a minimum viable product or just a very loose MVP and tested the market early on, we would have saved ourselves so much time and money and we really focused our product. And so that's what we did. Well, uh, you know, my team and I did very differently for Lat Connect 60 is we went out there and got that feedback. But used to say, as you say, Kevin, that the, the challenge is how do you get yourself out if you don't have something to show? Because you can't go in front of the senior execs of Rio Tinto or BHP Billiton or, or any large company for that matter, Sime Darby here in Malay, without a product. If you go and just say you've got a nice idea, they said you and everybody else, right? They're not going to give you time to hear your idea. So you do need to create some form of a product, uh, but what you might need to do is maybe not spend too much time or effort on that overall product, just enough 
of the user interface, some of the core functionality to demonstrate some of the capability, get in front and then iterate, be lean, very lean up front. So you're going to be con continuously iterating. You need a team that's going to be fast paced enough to iterate alongside you. Um, and then if you've got an MVP, find partners who can open the doors for you. So we worked with a lot of really good reseller partners. Um, I had connections from the corporate world uh, in the in, in various industries. Use those partners to get those key meetings so you can you can iterate, right? Yeah, and don't be afraid to uh, if you've got a beta product of some sort, don't be afraid to give it away if you can afford to, because you, you have to get it into the customer's hands. But, yeah, I, I think yep. just to add a bit more on, it's really when we started off as a company, there were two of us and no one knew about us. Um, obviously, and we couldn't even get meetings. And what we did and we found what worked was using affiliations where we leveraged on big brands name that we partnered up with and so on and use them to open doors to us, for us. And that was how we got in and we had that first meeting with a lot of these top executives. But I think meeting these guys, the first step, it's, it's just the first step. To put it into perspective, we are in that agriculture oil palm business space. And when we walk into a room, it's always two of us in our 20s. And there'll be, say, 10 of them, top level senior execs that are in their 50s, 60s, staring back at us. And they, their mindset will always be like, what does this two person know about our industry? They have no clue about what we're doing. And that's where I always take that first action and prompt them to let them know that, hey, we are not experts in your domain. We, you guys have a lot more experience for, than us. What we are doing is just proposing a solution but you guys tell us whether it works or not work and we would work and we'll improve on it. And that's what we realize is a lot of these senior executives and so on, they are very open to it when they realize that you respect them for their expertise. And that's the first step along the way. And I think just to share a bit of story in terms of how we closed our first corporate customer, it's one of the largest oil palm estate, a um, couple of billion dollars market cap in Malaysia. And they are our first customer for our analytics software. We went in, we pitched to them an entire whole analytics suite, basically automated tree counting, health detection and everything. But in fact, what was happening on the back end was just a group of guys manually tagging and manually counting the trees and classifying it. And that was what we were selling to them. But it actually worked because from the customer's perspective, they didn't know. Um, we proposed to run a POC, a demo plot for them. What we happened was we went out to view capture the data on the way driving back to the headquarter, we uploaded the data and the guys behind on the back end were doing all the calculations and the tagging. And that's how we got our first customer. And only after that, when we got a commitment from the client and we knew that it was something they wanted to pay for, then we invested that time and resources into building it. And that's how I think um, if you want to talk about lean startup, you should be running a business, fully validating it. A lot of businesses, I think the best businesses started off from a spreadsheet, just manually, doing manual data and so on. And only after they built up enough volume, then they went on to automate the whole process. Yeah, I think uh, I would share the opinion with JX and uh, Venkatesh here because we have uh, kind of tried uh, both the approaches, right? So um, one challenge definitely is uh, as a data provider, till the point that you have your uh, technology function until you have the data, right? How do you go to the customer? Uh, the solution is to build something to show to them, right? And uh, it could be a platform. It could be a, uh, like, so I'll give you an example from our end, right? So uh, we kind of developed a platform, right? Uh, where user can go select an area of interest and using, uh, the open source data set, we take, take that area of interest and, uh, have a data fusion backend software running on the backend. Right. And we give them the fuse data, right? So this is something we developed now. Uh, this is a part of the, uh, whole process, right. That we are promising once we have our own technology in place. Right. But this is something that number one, I can go to my customer and show them right now right? Pitch them right now. And maybe if they are, uh, they like it, uh, they like the concept, they'll probably invest in it. And number two is, uh, when I get my data, right. I can power this platform using that data, right? So it's not a complete waste of efforts. In fact, 
if anything it's actually kind of you know uh making me more efficient right so that's number one number two uh, as jx pointed out there are a lot of businesses right now uh which are kind of surviving on clumsy operations right and uh uh you might be lucky if you find early adopters who understand that uh what you are doing might be very transformational for their industry but uh all in all you have to like take this product that you have maybe take a use case and prepare a case study about how this use case uh, benefited from using your product and you know go to these customers and show them that your product you know saved x much amount x y amount of money for these uh, businesses and maybe if you have anything in specific we can customize it a little bit for you right so and then eventually they'll figure out that you know it's revolutionary in their domain as well right so it's win win for both yeah yeah uh, i recommend you uh, to ask it uh your investor first to introduce uh, the uncle customer potential uncle customer because uh investors for investors i mean the lps behind the investors are mainly uh, industrial sectors uh, i mean company and at least they are interested in startup company make the new thing so uh, we can utilize this interest for plc project development first and then uh before the first meeting we have to research about the company especially for how can i say understanding about their business structure potential issues the hypothesis is okay and we have to prepare some of the output image through this poc project so visualization is very important as a trigger of discussion so uh this output or demonstration would be better and then we can start the discussion with this uh potential anchor customers if uh yeah moving on uh if how can i say the discussion move on the next stage that's very good but if it can uh how can i say uh cannot do uh, that but uh, uh i think yeah at least two or three times trial is required after the how can i say breaking up <laughs> and then uh if uh the how can i say uh the discussion uh yeah completely stuck you can change you can ask investor again <laughs> to introduce other uncle customers and then at uh, this your yeah, cycle uh through this cycle you can accumulate some of the important issues needs from the customers and maybe it will be how can i say stick to other customers so you can how can i say make so many line up of the main industries issues the most solutions and then one of that would be would hit to your customer uncle customer and, and he, how can i say it is your uncle customer so we did it uh before our satellite launching with sentinel data and other terra x data like that and and we always i explain about this so our customer to customer if we launch multiple satellite you can get more high free, higher frequency data higher quality data for your business so we have to prepare for this so it's the yeah how can i say we how can i say use this phrase always uh for the yeah several meetings with customers so anyway investors is can introduce the right how can i say company for you i think thank, thank you so much that's very clear that's like you, you should write that in a book it's very clear <laughs> great well this is all being recorded so uh, uh i igars is going to uh, post this we'll we'll get it up on uh, on some website so you can go back and listen but um already uh the panel thank you so much you've got me worried about uh, igars 2023 cuz somehow i've got to um i've got to outdo what what uh, you all did here today this has been a phenomenal session and and thank you very much let's let's give them a round of applause and again, thank you all for coming. Uh, so we, we went over time. I apologize for that. But uh, if you have uh, any other questions, maybe we can mingle a little bit before they throw us out of here. So thank you and hope the rest of your IGARS is terrific. Thank you. What? Okay, great. All right, that's great.
Excellent. Thanks a lot for all the help. I never would have gotten that. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. Yeah, but it was great. Well, thank you guys, because I wouldn't have been able to get all that going. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.